coming up on the remarkable 20th century. On December the 31st, 1899, the New York Times ran an editorial stating, we step upon the threshold of 1900, facing a still brighter dawn for human civilization. The new century was beginning, bringing in the most remarkable era in history. I'm Howard K. Smith. Welcome to the remarkable 20th century. We've chosen January 1900 as the beginning of the 20th century because, as Walter Lord observed, the arrival of a new era is felt and not measured. And most Americans seem to feel in January 1900 that a new day had dawned. They appeared to feel that the 20th century was going to be a great century because it stood on the shoulders of a great one, the 19th century. The 19th had brought anesthetics and antiseptics, the telephone, electric lights, the phonograph, movies, the automobile, wonderful to use and wonderful to build on. The 19th had converted a thin coastal agrarian America into a continental industrial giant. Supplying the needs of great armies in the Civil War had created a brashly aggressive entrepreneurial class, and railroads had given it access to an unusually rich continent to exploit. Immigration, more immigrants were welcome into America each year than in all the other nations of the world combined, and that is still so. Immigration supplied most of a terrific working class of Henry Ford's workforce of 1914, a model for the industrial world. Three-fourths were recent immigrants. There's no such thing as a perfect government, but the American Constitution was probably the most advantageous for human development yet written and operated by a political class of farmers and merchants and lawyers strongly leavened with generals and one colonel named Roosevelt, it is not surprising that in 1900, America made known to the great powers of the globe that it wanted in. Inside America, two main forces were at work. One was big business, grown very big by the turn of the century. No individual symbolized it so well as J.P. Morgan, he of the bulbous nose and the get out of my way gait. The power of business had provoked a counterforce, a mighty nationwide reform movement embodied by no one so well as the brand new president sworn in in 1901, the immensely popular Theodore Roosevelt. Roosevelt called Morgan and his fellows malefactors of great wealth. Those were fighting words to those who considered themselves America's elite. In return, when Roosevelt went big game hunting, Morgan proposed sending a message of best wishes and good luck to the lions. The friction between those two forces would in ever-changing forms and degrees dominate much of the century. But that was not all that filled the century's first decade. Nineteen hundred was ushered in with great celebration and signified the beginning of a new era. But many aspects of the old century continued. The majority of Americans still lived in rural towns of less than 2,500, and the largest occupation was still farming. Life in 1900 maintained an element of simplicity. Yet in a matter of years, the relentless advance of the industrial age and increased migration to big cities changed the face of America, and the world was instilled with a burst of enthusiastic optimism. We had electricity, and then we had uh, a telephone, and all these different things that came along, one thing after another, and convenience just in the house. It was, it was really a wonderful world. The three largest cities, New York, Chicago, and Philadelphia, each boasted a million or more inhabitants, and the number rose steadily lured by the promise of a more sophisticated society and prosperous future. The political landscape around the world was also in the midst of transformation. 
In 1900, Queen Victoria of England presided over the largest empire in history. The British Empire encompassed territory on every continent with a total of over 400 million people. The British Empire at the beginning of the 20th century was a vast, complex enterprise. Something like 25% of the world's land mass was owned by Britain at this point. So it's a huge amount of land and territory. We're talking about Africa, we're talking about Asia, we're talking about the Caribbean, we're talking about parts of Europe. It's a huge, complex, and not always terribly well-governed empire. It's very expensive to run, but it's also the source of British pride and British identity in this period. And there was this whole notion of the British as being the most civilized race on earth. They were the people who would bring into civilization these more savage, these more childlike peoples. However, Britain's dominion was beginning to diminish. In South Africa, the Boer War, which had begun in 1899, continued on into the new century. The Boers were white Dutch settlers who had lived in South Africa since 1652. By the time Britain took control of the area in 1806, the Boers had a long history of hatred and resentment against what they saw as the interfering British people. The British are interested in this part of the world for a number of reasons, principally because we know by the 1870s or 1880s that it is incredibly rich in gold and in diamonds. And of course, everybody wanted a piece of that wealth. The British wanted to be able to control the economy and the pipeline, if you like, for those golden diamonds as it came through to the coast of South Africa, and the Boers were getting in their way. The Boers did not react well to the foreign newcomers, and eventually the situation exploded into violence. British troops held an overwhelming advantage and could not easily defeat the guerrilla-style fighting of the determined Boers. The war lasted three long years, a British force of 500,000 men, finding themselves constantly frustrated by Boer soldiers, who numbered less than 100,000, with the Boers holding an advantage by fighting on their home ground. Over 30,000 British soldiers would ultimately lose their lives. 8,000 Boers would also be among the dead. On May of 1902, peace was achieved. A treaty was signed by both sides, and the Boer republics accepted British sovereignty with the promise of future self-government. We think of the 1890s as a period we call the scramble for Africa. The Germans are busy taking territory in Africa and some of the other European countries too, and so are the British. And so what happens is that the Boer War also becomes a theater for Anglo-German conflict. And the ways in which the Germans choose to side very often with the Dutch settlers, with the Boers, really brings that conflict into, into a sort of higher mode. The tension between Great Britain and Germany would escalate even further, leading to a future confrontation that would involve the world in a war to end them all. In America, President William McKinley was finishing his first term in office. His administration had marked the beginning of vast changes in American attitudes and ways of living. McKinley's administration led a nation that was rushing toward a record output of goods and services. Half of the world's railroad mileage crossed America, making it the largest shipper of freight. The U.S. was the world's leader in oil production, steel forging, and gold mining. In November of 1900, McKinley was re-elected defeating Democratic Prairie Tornado William Jennings Bryan. His vice president was Theodore Roosevelt, the former governor of New York and colonel of the famed Rough Riders of the Spanish-American War. The Spanish-American War began on April 12, 1898, when the United States declared war on Spain after Spanish forces destroyed the American battleship The Maine in Cuba's Havana Harbor. In the Philippines, the U.S. proved their military superiority as Commodore Dewey faced Spain's fleet in the Battle of Manila Bay. The Dewey-led forces went on to defeat the Spanish Navy in a matter of days. Then Teddy Roosevelt and his Rough Riders charged up San Juan Hill and routed the Spanish forces on July 1st. The fighting lasted less than 100 days, and only 289 Americans lost their lives during it. Extremely popular with the people of the United States, the Spanish-American conflict was even dubbed a splendid little war by Secretary of State John Hay. After the Treaty of Paris, Spain sold the Philippines to the United States for $20 million, along with the territories of Guam and Puerto Rico. But the Filipino nationalists 
and their leader, Emilio Aguinaldo, had not fought the Spanish for freedom, only to fall under American control, declaring that the Filipinos would fight for their freedom from America, just as they had from Spain. Aguinaldo and his men began the Philippine War of Independence on February 4, 1899. Outnumbered and outgunned by the American forces, the Filipinos quickly adopted guerrilla-style tactics. It took the United States over 120,000 men and more than two years to subdue the Philippines. Finally, the violence ended when Aguinaldo was captured by the Americans on March 23, 1901. With the United States back in control, William Howard Taft was sent by President McKinley to serve as governor of the region. This ended the U.S. military rule that had controlled the island since May 1900. But the fighting for the Filipinos wasn't over. Still determined to have freedom at any cost, it would take decades for the region to truly gain its independence. Meanwhile, in China, the political environment was in turmoil. The Boxer Rebellion, a nationalist uprising against foreigners and Chinese Christians that began in 1899, came to a climax in 1900. The Boxers were peasants who were a kind of um, uh, sharecroppers. They, they were not landowners by any means. They had undergone a tremendous amount of economic misery. Due in part to intense floodings on Chinese farmlands, the boxers and their families had suffered years of intense poverty. From their point of view, the Westerners who had swarmed into China were the primary cause of their poor living conditions. Many of the Westerners were Christian missionaries, and the boxers regarded their entrance into the country as a kind of contamination. They saw the Westerner as someone who would destroy the traditional Chinese way of life. Also troubling was the current construction of a railroad, a project which brought an influx of Western workers to the country. With every job lost by a boxer, resentment of the West and its people grew. While the Chinese government did little, the boxers began to take action. They organized their numbers and gathered weapons to be used in a struggle that would, in their minds, reclaim China for her own people. As the violence against hated Westerners began, Chinese Christians also found themselves targets for the boxers' rage. Armed with rifles and other weapons, the boxers laid siege to the capital city of Peking on June 20th. For 55 days, the relentless siege continued, with terrified Westerners, many Americans among them, praying for the day when rescue would arrive. Finally, on August 14th, it did. After a long and difficult trek, the international allied troops reached Peking and by the following morning, the siege was ended. The expedition forces forced the boxers out. And of course, then uh, the Chinese government had to come to a, um, a, a kind of negotiation to so sue for peace. And um, it was a very daunting task for China because um, uh, the West collectively this includes uh, Germany, Japan, uh, U.S., England, France, eight nations, forced the Chinese to accept a incredibly heavy punitive indemnity equivalent to four to five years of the entire revenue that the Chinese central government collects. This harsh punishment only served to strengthen anti-Western sentiment in China. And as a result, more and more Chinese citizens found themselves on the side of nationalist revolutionary movements. In the coming decades of the 20th century, these movements would flower, sweeping up the most populated nation on Earth in bloody revolution. Nature wasted no time in marking the 20th century. On September 8th of 1900, a hurricane with gale force winds of 120 miles per hour devastated and nearly obliterated Galveston, Texas. It was the worst natural disaster the nation had experienced. 6,000 people died, and property damage soared to $20 million. Overseas, in 1900, an Austrian doctor named Sigmund Freud published The Interpretation of Dreams, awakening the world to new concepts in psychology. His groundbreaking ideas argued that the dreams of both healthy and pathological minds opened a window on a person's unconscious. Another contribution to the world of science came when Max Planck, a German physicist, proposed a mathematical equation called quantum theory, 
and ushered the world into the age of modern physics. The momentum created by continuing discoveries continued in 1901 with a revolution in communications. The work and research of a young Italian, Guglielmo Marconi, led him to transmit a transatlantic wireless signal, the Morse letter S. Marconi's work marked the beginning of an electronic age that later gave birth to radio, television, and cellular phones. Another milestone in communication, the telephone, continued to make its way into people's everyday lives. That was another wonderful thing that happened when I first took down that receiver on the telephone and heard a voice over the phone. What a wonderful, wonderful thing that was. First introduced in 1876, more than 1.5 million were in use at the beginning of the century. By 1910, almost 7 million were in use around the nation. In 1901, America struck it rich when two men in Texas made a discovery that would change the country forever. For years, Beaumont, Texas native Patio Higgins was convinced there was oil beneath the ground close to his hometown. The location was called Spindletop Hill, and Higgins drilled there for oil unsuccessfully several times in the 1890s. After running out of money, Higgins put an ad in the paper looking for financial help in drilling for oil. Only one man answered it. His name was Captain Anthony Lucas. With the help of Lucas, Higgins and his crew continued drilling despite experts telling them they would never strike oil. On January 10, 1901, their persistence paid off when the Lucas Gusher hit at 10.30 in the morning, sending a stream of black into the air over 100 feet. The well spouted uncontrolled for nine days before it was capped, putting out eight to 10,000 gallons a day during that time. When it was done, an oil boom and the petroleum age had begun. By 1902, 285 active wells were operating on Spindletop Hill, and over 600 companies had received charters. Some of those, like Texaco, Gulf, and Mobile, went on to become giants in the field. Together, they helped make oil an inexpensive and plentiful way to propel Americans and their cars into the 20th century. As the nation produced, the nation consumed. With this consumer demand came the birth of advertising. The number of ad agencies swelled as companies became more and more intent on advertising their wares. Sears and Roebuck and Montgomery Ward catalogs first appeared and introduced mail order to those living in rural areas. Our town, you could uh, buy certain things, but if you wanted something with a selection, you went to the Sears and Roebuck's catalog. They had a car harness section where they do horses and buggies and what have you, you know. We used to order groceries and furniture and women's shoes. No, everybody had a Sears and Roebuck's catalog. These retail wish books reached 10 million households by the end of the decade. The turn of the century was marked by extraordinary progress, industry, and seemingly limitless wealth, and became the age of the tycoon. The tycoons considered America as a land of inexhaustible abundance and had no problems with trying to tap as deeply into that source of abundance as they could. And they were able to do it in awesome quantities. And that was one of the factors that led to their successes in terms of sheer material gain. Most of the wealth was being held by a handful of tycoons, the most notable being American financier J. Pierpont Morgan, railroad magnate E. H. Harriman, Standard Oil's John D. Rockefeller, and the steel industry's Andrew Carnegie. In addition to the lavish lifestyles the giant trusts created for themselves, they also affected the lifestyle and pocketbook of every average citizen. Men, women, and even children labored long hours, often in punishing heat or cold, and in poorly lit and airless factories for an average yearly pay of around $500, adequate at best. By 1901, the popularity of a new rhythm called ragtime had spread across the land. First popularized in 1899 by the king of ragtime, Scott Joplin, and his maple leaf rag, the new sound, played mainly on the piano, traveled up from the Mississippi Delta and quickly became the music of the day. The new beat gave birth to new dances, and in 1900, it was the cake walk, quickly followed by the camel walk, buzzard lope, monkey glide, and kangaroo dip. 
literacy was reaching new highs and journalism flourished. The sensational yellow press of William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer continued to battle for readers. Abroad, in Paris and London, new dailies emerged and boasted circulations of one million readers. In January 1901, the world bid farewell to a prominent symbol of the 19th century. Queen Victoria of England died, bringing the Victorian age to an end. Queen Victoria's reign, of course, was a very long reign. It was more than 63 years, from 1837 to 1901. And by the time that she died, of course, she'd been on the throne for really two generations, at least. And so she'd really outlived quite a lot of people. And she symbolized 19th century Britain. It's not surprising that an entire era, almost a century, is named after her, Victorian Britain. So when she died, I think it was, it was both a tragedy at one level for the public, but at the same time, it was an opening up moment. It was a point, it was fitting in a sense that the new century began as Victoria ended and so I think the symbolism is both about what her reign stood for and therefore what the 20th century could be with the Victorian era and Queen Victoria herself out of the way. Her son and successor Edward VII signaled a new era of liberation. The wit and sense of style he brought to the monarchy infused the crown with vitality and a sense of fun making him well loved among the people. On September 14, 1901, America suffered its first national loss of the century. President William McKinley died from an infection caused by an assassin's bullet. Eight days earlier, he had stood shaking hands at the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, when Leon Zolgos, an avowed anarchist, stepped forward and pumped off two shots into McKinley's chest. Theodore Roosevelt, only six weeks short of his 40th birthday, took the oath of office and became the 26th president of the United States, the youngest man to ever hold the position. Teddy Roosevelt provided the American people with an image that was very important at the time. He was robust. He was full of the kind of energy that America needed. And he wasn't a cold, distant figure. He had an ebullient laugh and a big, famous, toothy grin. And he was someone that the people could relate to. And many really retrospectively have considered him the greatest president we've ever had. With his wife, Edith, and six children, Theodore Roosevelt infused Washington with a new, vibrant energy, and even renamed the executive mansion the White House. Roosevelt wasted no time in going to work. A West African proverb, speak softly and carry a big stick, you will go far, became his political motto. In the early part of 1902, Roosevelt's first target was the growing wealth and power of big business, particularly those companies enjoying monopolistic powers. Reviving the all-but-forgotten 1890 Sherman Antitrust Act, Roosevelt began his trust-busting campaign against big business. J.P. Morgan, Wall Street's leading financier, was outraged. Unfazed, Roosevelt gunned for Rockefeller's Standard Oil, American Tobacco, DuPont, Chicago Meat Packers, and some 43 other major trusts. He successfully trust-busted them all, and the public loved it. Adding to the trust-busting fury were the journalists attacking the nation's ills. Beginning in 1902, Lincoln Steffens, an editor for McClure's magazine, wrote a series of articles exposing the squalid conditions of city dwellers, including poor sanitation and rampant disease. By the end of the decade, some 2,000 similar exposés appeared in popular magazines, inciting the public for reform. Theodore Roosevelt felt most of the finger-pointing was over-dramatized and hyped and called the journalists muckrakers. But the muckrakers wore their title proudly and marched on. And where they left off, individual citizens took over, one of whom was St. Jane Adams, a former medical student who moved to the Chicago slums and opened a center for relief. She remained there for 40 years, badgering municipal authorities for better schools, sewers, and other services. Perhaps the most notorious of the individual reformers was Kerry Nation. Convinced that demon rum was the cause of society's ills, Nation entered saloons with her trademark hatchet, smashing bottles and terrorizing drinkers. Unrest was also troubling labor. In the fall of 1902, a strike broke out in the coal mines of Pennsylvania. Laboring under deplorable conditions, the miners wanted a pay increase but the coal mine producers refused to meet their demands, and Roosevelt called both parties to the White House to arbitrate. 
After threatening to use the army to operate the mines, he won a modest pay increase for the miners, an agreement he called a square deal. In 1903, at Roosevelt's request, labor came under government regulation with the establishment of the Department of Commerce and Labor. Another legacy of Roosevelt's presidency was his interest in the environment. A devout outdoorsman and former rancher, Roosevelt campaigned for the preservation of the wilderness. He eventually appointed the National Conservation Commission, leading to federal wildlife refuges and a marked increase in national parks. Roosevelt's interest in the outdoors also led directly to the introduction of a pop culture icon. When Roosevelt refused to shoot a bear cub while on a hunting trip in Mississippi, a cartoonist and toy maker capitalized on the publicity and introduced the teddy bear. Within the first year of his presidency, Roosevelt established a new role for government, that of main guardian of the public interest. In 1903, the American pastime celebrated its inaugural event. The first World Series between the American and National Leagues was played, with the Boston Red Sox defeating the Pittsburgh Pirates five games to three. Audiences also found enjoyment in other forms of entertainment in the early part of the decade. Theaters were thriving everywhere, 33 on Broadway alone. Actress Ethel Barrymore dazzled audiences and began a family legacy of actors that has spanned the entire century. Literature blossomed. In 1902, Joseph Conrad wrote Heart of Darkness, adding to his previous work, Lord Jim. Beatrix Potter first introduced the world to Peter Rabbit in the tale of Peter Rabbit. In the world of music, Debussy premiered his opera, Melisande, introducing audiences to new innovations in music. Although it received mixed reactions, the music's fluid, dreamlike style is considered the impressionism of sound. Music's popularity was spread by the Victrola and phonograph. These devices were the most popular form of home entertainment, allowing people to bring a symphony orchestra or opera star Enrico Caruso into their homes. But by far, the newest sensation was moving pictures. In 1891, Thomas Edison, already world famous for the light bulb and phonograph, exhibited the kinetoscope, a box with a peephole and a crank that rolled a few seconds of moving images. Soon these kinetoscope parlors enthralled viewers who paid pennies to see Fred Ott sneeze, a ballerina, or a kiss. By 1903, Edison had produced over 300 of these short films. At the same time in France, the Lumiere brothers had thrown a kinetoscope image onto a large screen, arguably the first picture show. Georges Melier, a Paris magician, broke new ground with the discovery of the special effect. Melier's experimentation with these special effects led him to produce his most famous film, A Trip to the Moon, in 1902, complete with moon girls and a rocket ship. In 1903, Edison produced the first Western, Edwin S. Porter's The Great Train Robbery, electrified viewers with 12 minutes of chases, gun battles, and a villain's death. The ending, with Justice S. Barnes firing his six-gun directly at the audience, caused some viewers to faint. Although in its infancy, the picture show's novelty offered another attraction to audiences interested in experiencing a new form of entertainment. And we went down to the theater, and we saw a very crude picture of people moving in that movie. And I went home, and I told my father about it, and he was so excited, he said he could not believe that they could do anything like that. The public clamored for more movies and places to see them. By 1905, the first Nickelodeon opened, a tiny dark room where for a nickel, he watched a few minutes of melodrama featuring endangered maidens, gallant heroes, and leering villains. Now that's one of the things we had, to, we had to pick up when we got the picture show here. We always had, all the kids went on Saturday, and the families went Saturday night. And my family went to every, I think they never missed a Saturday night. And then they'd go out someplace to a restaurant to eat after the show or something like that, you know. No, we, didn't, we never missed a Saturday for the picture show. 
well, it's only cost me a nickel. I used to sometimes take a girl with me. By the end of the decade, there were 10,000 Nickelodeons across the country, with people spending nearly $100 million to see them. Other inventions of the late 19th century advanced. Detroit had given birth to the automobile in 1896, when Henry Ford built a gas-powered quadricycle with no brakes. Although considered to be a toy for the rich and a terror-creating machine, the automobile was developing and could be found around the world. In 1903, Ford, facing competition from Ransom P. Olds and his low-priced Oldsmobile, founded the Ford Motor Company and prepared to mass produce his horseless carriage, a move that revolutionized the age of the automobile. I was about 12 years old when I saw my first automobile. My brother was chauffeuring for a doctor in New Haven, Connecticut for the summer, and the doctor allowed him to drive the car home to show the family. It was a Stanley steamer, and we drove up and the whole neighborhood came out from all around every street of them to see the first automobile. And we got in the car and he drove us around to show how it worked. It was a wonderful thing, the most wonderful thing they had ever seen for a car to go without horses. For many, America was the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. At the turn of the century, the U.S. population was 76 million. By the end of the first decade, it was hovering around 92 million, and one in seven were foreign-born. At the local general store, a loaf of bread cost three cents, a gallon of milk, 10 cents, gas was four cents a gallon. Two institutions were initiated during the decade. America adopted the gold standard for its currency, and to the delight of flower shops and card makers, mothers were honored in 1907 with the establishment of Mother's Day. For more than a decade, inventors had attempted to break the barrier of mechanized air travel. Brothers Orville and Wilbur Wright, two bicycle manufacturers from Dayton, Ohio, were privately testing their flying machine at Kitty Hawk, a remote beachfront in North Carolina known for its strong winds. After studying the dynamics of wind forces on airfoils and trying more than 200 wing shapes in their wind tunnel, they perfected the Wright Flyer, a biplane that was made of spruce and muslin, powered by a lightweight gasoline engine. On the chilly morning of December 17th, after winning a coin toss, Orville successfully flew 100 feet. The next flight went even further. The longest lasted 59 seconds and extended 852 feet. Well, the first test pilots are men like the Wright brothers, who not only had to invent an airplane and invent the principles of flight so that the airplane could actually fit into those and get into the air, they had to teach themselves actually how to fly. That may have been, in some ways, one of their most significant accomplishments. They taught themselves to fly and didn't die doing it. Other transportation gains were making news on the international scene. On November 4, 1903, after a near bloodless revolution, Panama declared independence from Colombia. The independence, supported under the table by Theodore Roosevelt, gave the United States the go-ahead to begin construction on a canal linking the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. Attempts had been made at building a canal across the Isthmus of Panama, but after bouts with yellow fever and engineering difficulties, the effort was abandoned. Now, over 20 years later, and aided by French engineer Philippe Bonavaria, the U.S. attempted the task again, digging a 51-mile-long ditch through swampland, a job that would take 10 years to complete. 1904 dawned, and with it emerged the teeth of anarchy, an ideology that regarded elimination of government as a necessary precondition for a free and just society. It gained a fevered following among the common people in Russia, who felt Tsar Nicholas cared little for the deplorable conditions and policies they were living under. Matters reached a flashpoint in St. Petersburg on a bloody Sunday in January 1905, 
Thousands of demonstrators gathered in the main square and protested. The Russian worker was protesting because they were starving. They had terrible living condition. They thought they are either forgot about them or just didn't care about them. The situation turned bloody because the Tsar was afraid. He thought that people came to kill him. He decided to send the soldiers and the Kazakh to send the people away. Tsar's troops fired on them, killing 70 and wounding several hundred. The brutality drove the revolution back underground but only to regain its strength for a later showdown. Russia was experiencing a blow on another front. The Russo-Japanese War, begun in February 1904, when the Japanese launched a surprise naval attack on the Russians at Port Arthur, entered its final eight months in January 1905. Japan had virtually destroyed the Russian fleet and advanced into Siberia threatening the Tsar's throne and tipping the entire balance of power in the Far East in their favor. This is Japan's way of showing that it has uh, become itself a world power. Uh, and it is also, in modern times at least, the first time that an Asian power confronts a non-Asian or European power and, and won. As the Japanese Empire grew stronger, so did U.S. concern over the threat posed to its interest in the Philippines. In an effort to head off future trouble, Theodore Roosevelt extended an offer to mediate a peace agreement. As a result, the conflict was settled in September, and Roosevelt consequently won the Nobel Peace Prize. Roosevelt's popularity increased, and in November, he won overwhelming re-election as President of the United States. As his second term in office began, Roosevelt wasted no time in affirming his stance on foreign policy by announcing a corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. The Roosevelt Corollary firmly established America's position as the world's policeman by declaring the right of the United States to intervene in the affairs of Western Hemisphere nations, a policy that has continued to shape world politics throughout the century. By 1905, with the world's politics at rest, breathless productivity resumed. The New York City subway was in operation. Automobiles got their first bumpers, and the 20th Century Limited made its first express train trip from New York to Chicago in 18 hours. In France, psychologist Alfred Binet devised an intelligence test and provided the first standardized means of measuring human intelligence. A man whose intelligence needed no testing made his debut in Switzerland. An unknown German patent clerk and mathematician, Albert Einstein, published a three-page paper on the general theory of relativity, a brilliant thesis that delved into the connection between matter and energy. His famous equation E equals mc squared was used to support his theory. Within 40 years, his ideas were realized in the form of the atomic bomb, and would forever change the face of the scientific world. 1905 also witnessed the debut of another notable European. In Paris, Dutch courtesan Margarita Zella MacLeod made her debut as Mata Hari, an erotic dancer who performed for private gatherings. Before long, her popularity and reputation spread, and she was playing the music halls of European capitals. In 1907, she became a spy for Germany, and in 1917 was executed by the French. In 1906, Lee DeForest became the father of radio by inventing a three-element vacuum tube, permitting greater amplification of radio signals. The world of literature continued to produce classics in 1906. A short story writer, William Sidney, more popularly known by his pseudonym O. Henry, published The Gift of the Magi. By far, the most controversial book of 1906 was The Jungle by a young Upton Sinclair. Researching a novel about the hard life of Chicago meatpacking workers, Sinclair discovered that much of the nation's meat contained tainted pork. Sinclair's expose caused such a furor that Roosevelt ordered an investigation that led to the passage of the 1906 Pure Food and Drug Act. For the first time, consumers were being protected by the federal government. 
At the turn of the century, with the American frontier nearly settled, cities became more populated than ever. The promise of wealth and prosperity in a new territory was appealing for many. But while the influx of people helped create financial success, the strain on other areas was also evident. Without modern safety regulations or city planning, many cities grew unchecked. This placed citizens in crowded and even dangerous living conditions. And with an expanding and unprepared population, one disaster could be enough to decimate a city that seemed on the verge of greatness. In San Francisco, California, one such disaster was just around the corner. Shortly before sunrise on April 18, 1906, San Francisco experienced a bone-jarring earthquake. The convulsing ground smashed buildings, tore up streets, and shattered gas and water mains. A massive fire blazed south of Market Street and swept past banks, skyscrapers, and homes, consuming all on its path. I went downtown like everybody did to see what was going on and seeing some of these people, uh, how, how, the, how it had affected them. They just didn't know what they were doing. There wasn't any, any part of the lower San Francisco that wasn't uh, knocked down and office buildings sank into the ground and uh, many people lost their lives in, the, in that fire. It was a very big fire. It happens that my dad was an MD and uh, they immediately uh, got hold of him and all other doctors in the city of San Francisco and put him into the Red Cross. That is, they gave him an armband of red and, and directed where the troubles were. Three days later, when the flames died out, some 500 people had lost their lives and 225,000 more were left homeless. In June of 1906, one of the decade's biggest scandals shook society during a performance at Madison Square Garden. Hot-tempered Harry K. Thaw, heir of a Pittsburgh steel and mining family, shot eminent architect Stanford White, who he accused of having an affair with his wife, actress Evelyn Nesbitt. Two murder trials ensued, and Harry K. Thaw was found not guilty by insanity and institutionalized. Evelyn Nesbitt, a former chorus girl and artist model, became a star on vaudeville. Nineteen oh seven was the peak year for immigration to the United States. Millions of immigrants were beckoned from every corner of the world to be part of America's golden promise. A large number of the arrivals of people coincided with the uh, industrial revolution, the industrializing of America. Um, a number of famines in Europe, the pogroms in Eastern Europe and in Russia. Um, it just happened to coincide with the time that um, the the need in America was great, and the desire to move from places that people were living in Europe or the Middle East uh, was also substantial, so they, they came here. A large majority of immigrants came from Southern and Eastern Europe. Those traveling first or second class went directly to the ports to be processed, while those traveling in steerage were admitted through processing centers such as Ellis Island. Ellis Island, it's the spot through which 40% of the population of the country today can trace the roots of one or more ancestor. So you see it has a vital role in the populating of America. Uh, in addition to that, it's sort of become the symbol or the epicenter of the populating of America, and people trace their roots here and trace their history here and trace their first steps in America here. Many of the new arrivals crowded into cold water tenements took what work they could find, and endured the scorn of native-born Americans. But just as those before them had done, the immigrants slowly became the new fabric of America. Nineteen oh seven witnessed new firsts in entertainment. Florence Ziegfeld glorified the American girl by producing the Ziegfeld Follies, a chorus line of beauties in lavish costumes. Two circuses, the Ringling Brothers and the Barnum and Bailey, merged and offered the most extravagant show ever seen under the big top. 1907 also brought new innovations and styles to the world of art. Inspired by the fragmented images of the father of modern art, Paul Cezanne, Spanish artist Pablo Picasso, already recognized from the work of his blue and rose periods, painted Les Demoiselles de Avignon, a painting that introduced the world to Cubism. 
a style that represented a subject with geometric shapes of multiple perspective. French artist Georges Braque followed with his own Cubist work, and both artists continued to produce paintings of neutralized color and complex patterns, profoundly altering the course of 20th century art. In 1908, Arnold Schoenberg wrote his second string quartet. Its last movement, which included a sung text for soprano about the spirit's journey to ethereal realms, is the first instance of truly atonal music. With this work, Schoenberg broke down barriers of harmony that have been the foundation of Western music since the Middle Ages. Innovations continued in science as well. Belgian-born inventor Leo Baekeland changed the world in 1907 with his invention of the first entirely synthesized polymer, better known as plastic. It created a revolution in manufacturing and has made an immeasurable impact on the 20th century. The automobile made new strides in 1908. Henry Ford continued to improve his cars, each model designated by a letter of the alphabet. In 1908, the Ford Motor Company had reached T, a motor car so low in price, any man making a good salary could buy it. There's a lot of romance about the Model T. You could, uh, once you bought one, you could equip it any way that you wanted. You could have a windshield or no windshield. You could. Uh, put special spotlights on it if you wanted special springs. You could tailor it to your own um, preferences and your own tastes. Uh, and a lot of people did. And a lot of people, it was frankly their very first car they ever saw. And a lot of people, it was the very first car they ever drove. If particular about the color of your car, Henry Ford would respond, you can have any color you want, so long as it's black. Soon, half the cars in America were tin Lizzie's. In 1908, working conditions, especially for women, were still a concern. The Supreme Court modified a 1905 rule allowing states to set standard working hours for women. Although most Americans still believed a woman's place was at the home, hundreds of thousands of young ladies had left their family kitchens to work as teachers, sales clerks, telephone operators, or office assistants. Women were learning to swim, drive cars, run businesses, play tennis and golf. In the world of sports, Texan Jack Johnson became the first black boxing champion. But his standing with the public suffered when his marriages to white women and his defiant attitude released a torrent of racism. Two years later, Jim Jeffries, a former undefeated heavyweight, was billed as the great white hope against Johnson in Reno, Nevada. But Johnson prevailed. On June 30, 1908, a giant fireball raced across the night sky. When it impacted the Earth in a remote area of Siberia called Tunguska, it exploded with the force of 1,000 Hiroshima bombs, killing herds of reindeer and scorching hundreds of miles of trees. Scientists have since determined it was a meteorite from an asteroid that fragmented in the Earth's atmosphere. 1908 also ushered in another presidential race. Theodore Roosevelt, holding true to a promise he made four years earlier, did not run again for office. Roosevelt instead focused his energy on supporting the candidacy of his friend and Secretary of War, William Howard Taft. Teddy Roosevelt recommended Taft to the Republican Party, confident he would carry on his progressive policies. In November, Taft, a massive figure weighing well over 300 pounds, became Roosevelt's successor and the 27th President of the United States. With politics behind him and always in search of a great adventure, Theodore Roosevelt set out for Africa on a hunting and traveling safari that lasted nearly a year. Another expedition was underway to the north. On February 28, 1909, Robert E. Peary, after two previous attempts, ventured forth again to conquer the North Pole. On April 6, in temperatures hovering at 50 degrees below zero, Peary and his team, which included his black assistant, Matthew Henson, reached the pole and marked it with the American flag. In an era when human rights and reform were being trumpeted, Matthew Henson was heralded a triumph by such men as W.E.B. Du Bois, 
Du Bois spent a lifetime battling for the rights of his people and often clashed with the highly respected Booker T. Washington, who took a more accommodating line on racial issues. Du Bois and Washington are often posited um, as opposites in that Washington is an accommodationist and Du Bois is more radical, when in fact both figures are a lot more complicated. In spite of his reputation for being completely accommodating, Washington does establish a school, the Tuskegee Institute, to try to empower African Americans economically. Basically what lay at the core of Booker T. Washington's political values was essentially economic self-determination and uplift. So essentially he believes that you need to have a strong economic base first before you can attempt to have political or social advancement. Du Bois, on the other hand, is also committed to African-American uplift um, and social equality. But what that means for Du Bois is um, in essentially educating a talented 10th, sort of establishing an elite cadre of African-Americans who can then go back and train other African-Americans and empower them academically, socially, and politically. In 1909, Du Bois joined other activists to found the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. The NAACP meets in 1909 and is um, founded. And this is a group comprised of about 60 men and women, um, and they're black and white, and they're sort of committed to challenging oppression. They want equality for African Americans. In 1909, as the progress of the new century continued, the last remnants of the old century faded away. The great Apache warrior Geronimo died, closing yet another curtain on the twilight of the Old West. Ironically, that same year, the Indian penny was replaced by the stately visage of Abraham Lincoln. In March 1909, President William Howard Taft was sworn into office and quickly continued Roosevelt's environmental policies. He set aside three million acres of public land for conservation, embracing the nation's growing enthusiasm for the outdoors. Taft also carried on Roosevelt's trust-busting efforts. During his four years in office, Taft busted twice as many trusts as Roosevelt. Although Roosevelt had hoped Taft would carry on all of his policies, the environment and trust-busting, as were any similarities between the two administrations, ended. Believing the progressives moved too fast, he sided with the more conservative wing of the Republican Party and ignored many of the reforms for which Teddy Roosevelt had fought so hard. As the first decade of the century came to a close, prospects for the future seemed limitless. Shortly after the world entered the new century, Theodore Roosevelt had exclaimed, the century upon which we have just entered must inevitably be one of tremendous triumph or tremendous failure for the whole human race. The rapid advances of the industrial age made triumph seem inevitable. Yet the dark side of the industrial revolution was beginning to stir and the stage was set for the first global tragedy of the 20th century to rear its ugly head in the next decade. Theodore Roosevelt was a new kind of president for the new century. He remains the youngest president ever. John Kennedy would become the second youngest. The first Roosevelt may well have been our most popular president. I doubt if his more celebrated cousin Franklin or any other were found as entertaining and beloved in their own times. He was that rare combination, a man of action, intense and permanent action, and a man of letters, the author of a small library of books. He met one of his own kind, young Winston Churchill of England, in America for a lecture tour, and they did not like one another, suggesting that in life as in electricity, likes repel. He loved words, and he fixed many phrases into our daily language. The White House was a bully pulpit. The best foreign policy was to speak softly and carry a big stick. Investigative reporters were muckrakers. Morgan and friends were malefactors of great wealth. But nothing was quite as ringing as his pronouncement on forming his own political party. We stand at Armageddon and we battle for the Lord. Making the pulse leap, though it wasn't for the Lord, it was to get elected. That brings to mind another high-powered phrase maker of those years. During the Boxer Rebellion in China, German troops were sent to the rescue. Kaiser Wilhelm saw them off with a speech in which he commanded them to cut down the rebels without mercy like, he said, the Huns of old. In our next program, the 1910s, 
how those words came back to haunt the Kaiser. Next time on the remarkable 20th century. I and the bomb of and we battle for the Lord. This was the war to end all wars. It was very forceful and radical. Milton tried to create international order.